Uh, hello and welcome to the latest session in our Stronger Together series. Today's session follows those from Bruce and Paul, who discussed all the work we're doing to keep people safe and support the communities in which we operate, as well as providing updates on rough sales and production. We then heard from Anne, who provided a detailed overview of all the things that we're doing as a company to care for our employees at this time of turmoil. I hope that those of you who joined us for these sessions found them both of value and interest. We're running this series of online events for two main reasons. Firstly, to allow us to impart up-to-date information on a variety of key issues that may be relevant to you during this period. And secondly, to provide you with the opportunity to share your concerns or experiences with our senior leadership team. We see both aspects as being vital to the success of this series, as it's not our intention to just broadcast. We are seeking to continue a conversation with you and get your valuable input. We've still planned several more events over the coming weeks, which will cover innovation, marketing and branding. And I do hope that you, your colleagues and associates will join us for as many of them as you possibly can. But turning now to today's session, I have to admit that I'm introducing it with a tinge of sadness, as I would much rather have been in our office welcoming our customers to Botswana for what would have been the start of site week four. But for the reasons that we're all now too familiar with, that of course has not been possible. However, please be assured that having the opportunity to welcome you all to this session is by far the next best thing. And I'm also delighted to say that today we are joined by De Beers Group Chief Financial Officer Nimesh Patel. Nimesh will talk you through several areas we hope will be of interest. These will include how we're navigating the COVID crisis, what we know about the impact that the crisis has had on demand in both the US and China, a review of the current economic climate in the US, how the actions we're taking now are focused on putting the company on a good footing for the future, the importance of standing together, and finally, how we're using this time as an opportunity to reshape the business. As we have done previously, we'll be running a question and answer session following the Mesh's talk. So please do submit your questions in the Q&A facility on your screen, and you can ask these at any time from now. We'll be happy to answer questions directly relating to the Mesh's presentation, or indeed any other related or more general midstream topics. Thank you once again for joining us, and now it's my pleasure to hand over to Nimesh. Thank you, Bernard, and thank you everyone who's joining us today for this session. During this challenging time as the world adapts to the COVID pandemic, I think it's more vital than it's ever been that we remain a community that we share our struggles and that we really work together to find solutions. But most importantly, that we keep speaking to each other. Thanks for the difficult actions that you're taking to preserve our industry and our future in this time. Many of you, as Bernard said, have already heard from Bruce, Paul and Anne. Today, I hope to share with you some of my perspectives as CFO as we seek as De Beers to navigate many of the same uncertainties that all of you are facing and that are foremost on your mind. I'm going to start with the most important and most challenging aspect of this crisis, and that is the impact it has on our people. Our people are the business and our people are struggling. They're facing many of the same concerns that all of us are facing, concerns for their health, concerns for their family, concerns for their community. I know I am, and I know that my parents, as an example, are firmly in the at-risk category. 
There is a great deal of unknown and that drives insecurity. People not understanding how the impact of this crisis will influence their employment, their income and their future security and that of their families. And this, of course, then impacts on their well-being and their readiness to respond, their readiness to help support all of us as we try and sustain and drive forward our businesses. So what have we done to address this challenge? I think first and foremost, we've found that frequent and consistent communication really remains vital. And so easy these days, as we're seeing right now, enabled by technology. So engaging regularly and often and being transparent and honest with our people has been the mantra that we've observed. And we've also seen the terrific things that many of you are doing across your communities to support from the provision of healthcare to the provision of food. And we've done some of the same, making donations in the countries in which we operate to help support charitable causes and help support the people that are our business and our communities. Let me turn now to what all of this means and what, of, what all of this means in terms of demand, particularly in the US and China, our two largest markets. So we know that this crisis began with a significant impact on China, but that the epicenter is now in the US, having spread from east to west. And in the US, much as in other countries, a lockdown has been put in place to try and slow the rates of infection. But of course, this impacts very materially the economies in which we operate. We've seen in the US temporary closures of the US retail market, for example, Tiffany's, uh, Signet's 2,900 stores, Macy's, Nordstrom, JCPenney, Bloomingdale's and others have closed their doors. The US unfortunately uh, started really strongly in January and Feb. So what's unfortunate about that is that we haven't been able to capitalize and continue on that trend as a result of COVID. In January and February, it was up 15 to 20 percent, but March was down by around about 30 percent by our estimates although diamonds did perform ahead of the total jewellery category. We continue the weakness, uh, we expect the weakness to continue into April. But the good news is that the US is starting to reopen. Some businesses will start to allow customers back through their doors. But notwithstanding that, we are expecting uh, an ongoing and severe impact. If you look to the stock markets or you look to US unemployment numbers, you can see that people's disposable income and people's confidence to spend is going to be lower. And the recessionary pressures are rising and we expect the impact of those to continue into 2021. And though all of those things will have a material impact on diamond demand. This is why we're seeking to lead through our response to production. Let me share with you some of the data that we have. So economists at Goldman Sachs, for example, have estimated that in the second quarter, the US economy will shrink by 11%, and in the third quarter by 7%, and in the fourth quarter, it will shrink by 5%. Each one of these quarters is the weakest on records in the post-war period. Q2 versus Q1 will be down 34%, but the good news is we'll start to see some of that gap close in Q3 and Q4. So Q3 versus Q2 up 19% and Q4 versus Q3 up 12%. So that's the path to recovery. Governments are taking action. In the US, the federal deficit's likely to be at about 20% of GDP with trillions of dollars being put into asset purchases. But as I said before, there will be negative consequences. Employ unemployment, as an example, running at probably about 15% of those actively seeking work, again, the highest in the post-war period, almost 30 million people, and using broader measures of unemployment, about 25%. The stimulus that the governments are across the world are pumping into their economies will help. It'll help fill that hole left by the private sector. The good news is because it's filling a hole, we hope that it'll have less inflationary impact. And the consequence of that is 
low inflation means hopefully persistently lower interest rates, which will help get the economy back on its feet. We've seen various surveys done across the luxury goods space, one by BCG, who we work with. They've estimated that since the beginning of this crisis, when many people thought that the impact would be in the order of three to six months, that was back in February, now people are predicting that the impact will be closer to 12 months. And a survey of luxury goods CEOs and CFOs has suggested that there will be approximately about a 30% impact on sales on the $114 billion global personal luxury market with the recovery coming in late 2021 and into 2022. Now in the midstream, you all know that the major cutting in trading centers have been on lockdown for just over a month now. And there have been restrictions on travel and challenges in moving goods, the same challenges that we faced at De Beers and why we weren't able to run site three and why site four has also been challenging for us. But at the same time, I've seen the work, for example, of the BDB in India, the Help Us to Help You campaign around restarting business. And I've read the message from Anoop as president, and I'd like to say that that's just wonderful work. But there'll be significant falls in polished exports. We understand that and a reduction in liquidity as a result of buildup of stocks. Now, let's think about what the China story can teach us. So the reopening of the China market is a big positive. And if we can avoid a second peak in infection in China, there's much to, be, there's much to look forward to. So we track a series of different measures. The first is the ability to get people and goods moving again, which is looking at the congestion index in China. And looking at those statistics, they're back now to 2019 levels as of the end of April. We always look at uh, whether industry is performing well. How well is industry restarting in China? And there we track coal consumption. Coal consumption has also been rising since the restart and is also back to 2019 levels. And finally, the confidence to invest capital and spend money. And there we've looked at property transactions which have also restarted strongly and are almost back to 2019 levels. In terms of forever marked doors, and we've looked at the sales of some of the larger retailers in China, we think that in February, footfall and sales were down about 90%, but as of March, that had recovered to about 20 to 30% down versus the prior year. And there is some expectation of a release of pent up demand in China. And if that ends up being a similar story in the US, once the economy opens, there is much to be positive about. So what are we doing as De Beers in the face of these challenges that I've just outlined? Well, you'll have seen some of this already, but the first thing is we're looking after our people, as I said, right up front and making sure that they're able to operate in a safe way, remotely where possible. Secondly, as a major producer, we've reduced the amount that we will produce this year. And you'll have seen in the Anglo-American updates that we've taken about 7 million carrots out of our production, about 20% down, but our sales will be even lower than that. We've provided 100% flexibility to our customers. And, for reasons that you're aware of, such as the availability of routes to market, we've suspended site three and now site four for the first time, again, in the post-war period since the Second World War. What we're also seeing in the space is that Diamond Juniors are also suspending operations and auctions, putting some of their assets onto long-term care and maintenance. By our estimates, there is as much as 7 million carats of annual production that is suspended beyond just the short term COVID related issues due to the weakness in the market. We're also seeing limited capital going into the extension of life of many of the producing assets. And that means that it will accelerate the reduction in supply going forward. Much of this provides support to a beleaguered industry, reducing supply to meet demand and creating stability which should have a positive impact. 
and of course were well positioned then therefore for a recovery in demand. And demand will return. We mustn't forget that our product remains a powerful symbol of connection and meaning that will have a unique role to play as people emerge from lockdowns and mark their relationships. The early signs from China are again encouraging in this respect, with pent up demand from delayed weddings, uh, all compressed into a single season and self purchases to reward hardships overcome. And those are going to be the focus of our marketing campaigns. And a sustainable recovery of the industry requires us to understand in which in which ways consumers will experience goods and services. And to an extent, this will have changed, perhaps permanently. So we're continuing to drive innovation through the integration of digital supply chains and the power of brands. During this tough time, particularly in my role as CFO, we're focusing on what's important, the immediate actions we need to take. And that means taking tough steps now to avoid deeper cuts later. This is all about cash preservation. How do we manage working capital? How do we reduce our costs? How do we take those tough decisions? You'll be aware already that the executive committee of De Beers has taken a 20% reduction in pay. Secondly, we're thinking hard about how do we build a flexible operating environment? Of course, there are many things we know already in terms of working from home, but have we thought about cybersecurity as an example? It's important that we don't forget these issues. The second is how do we take faster decisions? Again, something that is vital in this at this time and in this market. But again, how do we make sure that we protect our businesses against fraud and we maintain controls and governance? And finally, disruption. We rely heavily on our supply chains, all of us, and we need to be more flexible in the way in which we work with our supply chains and evaluate alternatives as different cogs in that chain are struggling with different issues and some may be over, able to overcome those issues, but others won't. That leads me to the importance of balance sheet flexibility to weather the difficult period. All businesses that have started from a low point of leverage that have a spread of maturities, that have a diversity of sources of funding and that have maintained good relationships with their lenders will prosper in this environment. Access to capital markets remains a competitive advantage and the ability to have the flexibility to weather storms like this through having a strong balance sheet and a differentiated access to capital, diversity of capital is what will help get people through these cyclical downturns. Now we're all in this together. I've talked about supply chains already. Our partnerships across those supply chains are key. We've got to support our suppliers. We've got to remember that we're going to need them afterwards once the recovery is in full swing. We need to be there for our customers because our customers will remember who showed flexibility and who didn't. Relationships, as always in this industry, remain the core of everything we do and the basis of our business. And Paul has talked in the previous session about what we've done. And there's a recognition here across all the actions that's being taken across the value chain to build those partnerships and to make sure that we weather the storm together. Now, no one knows how this is all going to play out. And therefore, I think it's important that we do plan for a lengthy disruption. I talked earlier about the feedback from the BCG survey and the view that the recovery could be as late as 2021 into 2022, notwithstanding that we'll get over the immediate COVID related issues, but we'll still be facing into 20, early part of 2021, the recessionary uh, hangover of the current, current issues that we face. So the first thing to identify is that there's really an unknown time frame here. And therefore, we've got to plan on a scenario basis for how we'll overcome the next couple of years. And a lot of that will depend on when a vaccine is available, when we can really be confident that we've tackled the issue. 
So the key questions are, how long does the immediate lockdown last? Once we come out of the lockdown, what does a new normal functioning of the economy look like before we have a vaccine? As governments across the world try to flatten the curve of infections, and how long will that last? And then the third is, how quickly will we come out of that? And what will a recovery look like in the context of those recessionary pressures I've mentioned a few times already? So planning for different scenarios is key, and that's what we're doing. Having said that, the other thing we must bear in mind, as I've said already, is that this is a cyclical, not structural issue. The industry will recover, demand will return, and supply will have reduced. We've seen that in prior downturns. We've seen that in the bounce back from 2008-9. We've seen that in the bounce back from 2015. Yes, this is different, but this is a one-time short-term impact. It is not a structural break in our industry. When BCG interviewed uh, a number of different fund managers that account for over $4 trillion of investment in various listed companies, they felt that whilst the immediate COVID impact might not be over till the end of the year, that a recovery may actually look more U-shaped. 85% of those people were bearish on the current year, bearish to neutral on 2020, but positive about the recovery in 2021. And having that context in our minds, I think the last thing I'll say is how do we take this opportunity to really think about what this means for our businesses longer term. I've talked about some of the longer term trends. I've talked about the fact that the way in which consumers engage with our product may change, uh, particularly in terms of the power of brands and the way in which they buy. I've also talked about the fact that supply is likely to be reducing into the future. So how do we apply a transformation mindset as we go through the process of navigating the current crisis? How do we make decisions that protect us in the short term, but actually help us build in the long term? In our case, we are maintaining investment in those things that remain critical for the future of our business and our industry. We will continue to spend money on marketing. We will continue to invest in the Venetia Underground project, in the delivery of a new mining vessel in Namibia, in the life extension of a number of our assets, including Xuanang in Botswana. And our firm belief and my firm belief is that those who will win coming out of this crisis will be those who are best positioned, having taken the tough calls early, but also continue to invest in the long term future of their businesses and position themselves to benefit from the recovery that will come. So thank you very much. Those were the, 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 the observations that I had to share with you, and I'd be very happy to address any questions on those.